Governor Martinez of Florida was in Portland yesterday along with a delegation of about 18 or 20 uh, visitors from Florida uh, as a guest of the Canadian government uh, to look at our light rail facility. At a luncheon yesterday, I had the opportunity to visit with three of the members of that delegation. Uh, one was a mayor, one was a county commissioner, and one was the chief of staff for Governor Martinez. Uh, after we had some casual conversation about Max and about how beautiful the city of Portland was, the conversation immediately led to, what are you doing with your garbage? Are you landfill? Are you burning? What are you doing? We really want to know. This is our biggest problem in Florida. <coughs> and we're asking and we're discussing this during our travels around the country. This is a nationwide problem and it's certainly a problem uh, here in Oregon. The topic literally results in daily headlines in the media, uh, not only here in Oregon but nationwide. In the Portland metro area, this problem rests in the lap of the only elected regional government in the United States. That's our Metropolitan Service District, which we finally fondly refer to as Metro. Uh, Metro operates the St. John's Landfill and other solid waste facilities in the region, coordinates transportation planning and land use, operates the Washington Park Zoo, and is managing the construction uh, of the Oregon a convention center. Rena Kuzma took office as the executive officer of Metro uh, in January of this year. She's the second executive officer in Metro's brief, his, uh, brief history and is, uh, and is serving her first elected post. She was raised uh, on a ranch uh, in eastern Oregon, came to Portland in the 1960s. She put herself through college in uh, one of the state's finest universities, Portland State University, uh, while raising a family, and gained a bachelor's degree in English literature. Before finishing her degree, uh, she worked uh, for then Congressman Edith Green as staff director on the House Subcommittee on Higher Education, which Congressman Green chaired at the time. She returned to Portland in 1969, finished her degree, and went on to become assistant director of the Portland Model Cities Project. In 1969, she was uh, hired to staff the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners. She then became executive assistant to uh, County Executive Don Clark, and in 1977 became director of the Multnomah County Department of Environmental Services. She was the first woman to serve as the head of a major city's public works department. She oversaw 430 employees, an annual budget of $32 million, and major activities such as road maintenance, uh, capital construction projects and so on. Her first challenge as Metro Executive Officer was to establish the necessary authority in the position to enable her to carry out the responsibilities of the office. She did this with determination and with great skill. The challenges ahead are very real and the timelines are short. Please welcome Metro's Executive Director, Rena Kuzma. Good afternoon. Thank you, Phil. And thank you all for having me here today. I hope you've finished your lunch because my topic today isn't really considered appropriate for lunch and conversation. Yet I'll have to confess it's become one of my favorite subjects. It's the single largest public works challenge in our region and in communities all across the nation. It's a resource that can create jobs and energy. It will require significant public investment in the next five years. And most importantly, it takes a high level of public commitment to find solutions and to make sure they work. Some people call it by its technical name, solid waste, but I call it what it is, garbage. I've learned a lot more about garbage in the last seven months since becoming Metro's executive officer. The Portland metropolitan area, not unlike others around the country, has a big problem. How do we dispose of more than a million tons of garbage every year? But as we say in the world of garbage, 
Problems can be opportunities, and we in the Portland metropolitan area have some pretty big opportunities. The biggest opportunity is to get our garbage problems solved, solved now, solved for the long term, and solved without chaos and rancor. Right now, as most of you know, almost all of our garbage is dumped in one place, the St. John's Landfill. That's where it's been going for more than 50 years. But for the last decade, we've known that the landfill is filling up, and is filling up fast. It's had several reprieves, but we're approaching the point of no return. We will have to close the St. John's Landfill at the latest by February of 1991. We at Metro are working now to ensure that we have alternatives for all of that garbage. Let me share with you some numbers that demonstrate the gravity of the situation. First, on the average, each one of us creates one ton of garbage a year in the Portland metropolitan area, where we have about a million people. That's about a million tons of garbage every year. Second, garbage is a growth industry. Even though our population isn't growing that much, we create about 50,000 more tons of garbage every single year. Third, the average U.S. household get rid, uh, gets rid of 1,800 plastic items, 850 tin cans, 500 aluminum cans, 500 glass bottles, and more than 13,000 pieces of paper every year. And in our region, you can add to that 150,000 tons of yard debris. Of course, some of these items are recycled. Still, most of it eventually ends up in the landfill. Imagine for a moment if this were the case with sewage. Imagine that there was only one sewage treatment plant for a million people, and it had to shut down without a replacement in sight. Imagine for a moment that there was only one supply of water for a million people and it became contaminated and there was no backup source. Imagine for a moment it's 1991 and we have no place to dump our garbage. Well, that's not going to happen because we're going to do something about it today and we're going to do it right. But first, there are several objectives. The system we develop must be balanced so that we are not overly dependent on any one solution to garbage disposal. The days of relying only on a landfill are gone. Garbage has too many resources in it simply to dump it. The system has to be affordable. The cost of garbage service must be reasonable to the average consumer. Even though it is inevitable that the cost of handling garbage must rise, we must keep these costs within reason, and we must do it long term that demands a system which has enough alternatives built into it that it can keep costs competitive. Next, the system must be environmentally sound. It must employ the best and latest technology and ensure that we are cleaning up a problem, not just sweeping it under a rug or creating a danger somewhere else. We must also have a, a system that is flexible. That enables, that enables us to take advantage of new technologies as they arise. And last, we have to have a sense of urgency. We have to make the hard decisions and have the facilities up and running as soon as possible. Delay is simply no longer a choice. As you know, Metro is committed to recycling. And through an aggressive program, we hope that we can double the amount of waste we recycle in the metropolitan area in the next five years. Still, that's not the whole picture. We will need landfills and new technologies that will allow us to take resources back out of garbage. And if we can do that, this region will be way ahead of the rest of the nation and we will live lived up to our national reputation as a leader in environmental policy. Within the last six months, we've all become much more aware of garbage. First of all, here in Oregon, since last June, cities and counties have been required to have curbside recycling. Citizens are more aware of their garbage now that they have the home opportunities to recycle. But there's another reason. A certain barge that is still floating somewhere out on Long Island looking for a home. That garbage barge captured our, our attention when it sailed from Islip, New York, south into the Gulf of Mexico, and back north where its journey began. But that 3,100 tons of garbage has yet to find a home. There are several lessons that we can learn from this case. Handling garbage is not first and foremost a problem of landfill space. It's not even a problem of proper technology. It's primarily a problem of communication, cooperation, and commitment. There was and still is room in that landfill on Long Island. But in order to make their limited land landfill last longer, while they're building an incinerator, commercial waste has been prohibited. With no local place to dump it, the city contracted with a private party to take it away. 
The private contractor planned to barge it to a location in South Carolina and turn it into fuel. Unfortunately, the private contractor never really got permission to do that. And so because of poor leadership and poor communication between state agencies, local agencies, and private parties, the garbage barge is now so infamous it may never find a home. There is a great irony here. Almost all of the garbage on that barge is recyclable paper. It came from offices, not unlike where most of us work. Think about that when you go back to work to your offices this afternoon. Think about it every time you crumple up a phone message, a memo, or an old letter. Think about it and then give us a call at Metro. 224-5555. And we'll help you set up an office paper recycling system. Because, and this is the last lesson I want to draw from the garbage barge, the amount of garbage on that barge is just a little more than this region produces every single day. Many private businesses also have their minds on garbage. Where citizens see a problem, businesses see an opportunity. Waste Management of Oregon, Waste Tech, Tidewater Barge, Rydell Environmental Technology, Grimm's Fuel Company, Oregon Processing and Recovery Center, Waste Recovery Incorporated. Those are just a few local companies that are interested in helping us solve our garbage problems. Handling garbage is an industry. It creates taxable properties, capital investment, and payrolls. The garbage business pumps money into the economy. For example, a waste to energy incinerator in St. Helens would add a million and a half payroll and two million dollars in property tax to that community. We at Metro sense a new attitude about garbage. We're aware of the problem, but we and increasingly businesses and, company and communities are aware also of the opportunities. As I mentioned at the beginning of the speech, Metro is, pre is preparing to solve our solid waste problems for at least the next 20 to 30 years. We are at this stage because of a number of processes which are all coming together at the end of this year. Metro is nearing completion of a two-year process for deciding on a resource recovery system for the region. I've recommended to the Metro Council that we build both a waste to energy facility in St. Helens and a garbage composting operation in Portland. There are also landfill options to consider both here in our region and in Eastern Oregon. These are the pieces to the great garbage puzzle and our challenge is to put those pieces together in a picture that makes sense economically, environmentally, and politically. Metro's challenge is to solve the problem for us, for our children, and for our grandchildren. That means coming up with the best landfill options, options that are affordable, environmentally sound, and which best protect the long-term public interest. That means getting the base, best waste to energy incinerator we can, because we will need to reduce the amount of material we are landfilling and begin converting garbage to a needed resource. It means trying a new technology, such as mass composting of garbage, to see how well it works and if we can develop it into a major component of the system. And finally, it means starting a planning process that will allow Metro to work together with local jurisdictions to create a solid waste management plan that everybody can agree upon. We have started that process now at Metro. We call it our functional planning process for solid waste. For some time, Metro has had the same responsibility for transportation planning working with a technical advisory board and a policy advisory board of representatives from the cities and the counties in the region, we have developed priorities that we can all agree upon. But let's face it, it's going to be much tougher to gain the same kind of agreement among cities, counties, and agencies for solid waste facilities. We have an inkling of that problem when we see the problems DEQ has had finding a site for a new landfill or Metro has had siting facilities such as transfer stations. But what are the alternatives? We certainly can't continue to do things as we have in the past. That approach produced a burner we couldn't build in Oregon City, a landfill we couldn't site at Wildwood, and a transfer station in Washington County that was so unsuitable it wasn't worth fighting for. In the case of the Washington County transfer station, citizens against government and government against government were fighting it out in a court process that was expensive and time consuming for everyone involved. We lost valuable time in these efforts to get our garbage facilities online, and we squandered precious credibility defending a site and a permit application that had obvious flaws, and now we are beginning again to search for a transfer station. This time, I think we can do it right because we are initiating this cooperative, balanced, and, and fair planning process 
that involves all of the actors and will produce a regional solid waste plan that identifies sites and shares responsibilities. But it will take more than successful planning to handle gar our garbage problem in the region. It will take more than technology and more than landfills. It will take personal and social commitment to change our habits. That means recycling at home. It means recycling at the office. And it means purchasing different kinds of products and reducing the amount of packaging we put up with. You and I simply cannot afford to continue to produce a ton or more of garbage every year. Yes, in the short term, Metro must and will develop ways to dispose of our garbage. That's job number one in solid waste, and we will do it. But in the long term, you and I must drastically cut the amount of waste we produce. Metro is dedicated to both propositions, the short-term answers and the long-term solutions. But we won't get anywhere without the support and assistance from every person in this region. There's an old saying in the garbage business, everybody wants you to pick it up, but nobody wants you to put it down. <laughs> well, short of creating our own homeless barge we're, every day, we're going to put it down somewhere. We are going to find answers to our garbage problems. And either we're going to do it methodically and cooperatively, or we're going to do it chaotically and with rancor. Working together, I believe we can show the rest of the nation how to do this job right. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rena. Uh, we're now ready for questions from the audience. Uh, staff will now circulate and uh, uh, collect the written uh, questions if you care to do that. Uh, forms are on the uh, tables for that. Uh, City Club members only may ask questions. And uh, I also encourage members to uh, approach the microphone, which will be there shortly, uh, to uh, uh, ask uh, questions as well. So Bill Wyatt, uh, the first question. Thank you. As you alluded uh, to in your discussion, solid waste discussions always seem to come down to uh, citing locally unacceptable land uses. Uh, the legislature two sessions ago sought in their wisdom to give the Department of Environmental Quality uh, and the Environmental Quality Commission what seems to be bulletproof authority to cite uh, a facility. Uh, they've made their decision <coughs> regarding Bacona Road. Obviously, uh, that if it is cited, will not be the final uh, locally unacceptable land use that goes along with the uh, solid waste debate. How would you propose, in light of the history uh, that we've experienced in this region, uh, how would you propose that Metro or other local governments get about the process of citing these locally unacceptable land uses, or so-called? <laughs> Well, you're right. Uh, I'm not sure it is bulletproof. Bacona Road is under appeal, as you know right now. Uh, it is not an easy job to do. I think, and I think the way to do those kinds of things, not only with landfills, but with uh, transfer stations, recycling centers, uh, all of those kinds of facilities, which have been so difficult, is to do it through functional, what we call functional planning. I think you have to do it with uh, cooperation of the, of the local communities with cooperation of local governments. And the fact remains that uh, our constituency in this region knows they create garbage. They know we have to find a place for it. And when we initiated the functional planning process some three or four months ago, we had great response from the local communities and the local governments. We have been out to every single local government, all 24 cities. In fact, we've even gone to some just outside the region. And they have been supportive. They've been anxious to cooperate and anxious to be part of the planning process. And they know that they're going to have to take some of that responsibility. Uh, the next question we'll take will be a written question. Don't be bashful, folks. Where is the microphone? Oh, there it is. It's there. If contracting with a third party for disposal at a landfill outside the Portland region proves to be the preferred alternative, uh, what actions, if any, should Metro take regarding a local Metro-owned landfill site in order to assure the region of, of a long-term landfill? Uh, what major criteria might be used to make this kind of a decision? I think that is a real option. Uh, I, I believe that the, the trick to all of this 
is to have a balanced system. I don't believe we need to have uh, particularly an 800 acre landfill in the metropolitan area if we've got two or three options elsewhere that work and are cost effective. The big question has to do with cost effectiveness, environmental issues, and in order to keep our options, you have to have a balanced system. You can't just rely on a landfill. We have to have a flexible system that can deal with future technology. That world is changing so quickly right now that uh, how we're handling garbage today is certainly not going to be how we're handling it probably five years from now. The options we're looking at do have long-term stability. But basically, I think that uh, it's a real option that we might take it out of the region. And if we do, then it's my position that we ought to cut loose the site, the site that is here. If we find that is the, uh, the best option, we ought to cut it loose and not have it impact that community long term. Unless we have a use for it, and we may have, but if we do not, then we shouldn't hold on to it. Another written question. What kind of strategies would Metro consider to reduce the amount of garbage generated by each household or business? Well, of course, uh, I did speak to some of those. We're, we're dealing with uh, strategies in our recycling program right now. Uh, while recycling is not mandatory in Oregon, and I personally don't support mandatory recycling, uh, by and large because of the difficulty in enforcement and the problems it creates. Uh, we do have a, a mandatory program in that uh, the cities and uh, the haulers are required to provide the opportunity. Uh, the, the big issue here is how you educate the public, what can you do with it, are there alternatives, and Metro is working in all of those areas right now. We have, an, uh, we have a second year program going on in terms of a major education program. Uh, we do a lot of public information. We have a recycling hotline. And I think that's the key to it is, is by and large, educating the public, one, about the opportunity, two, what they can recycle and how to do it, how to make it more efficient, how and who can pick it up and when. And uh, those are the kinds of things that we're really pushing at this point in time. Yes, welcome. Thank you. Clyde Doctor, member. Rena, I'd like to take advantage of your rare appearance here uh, to perhaps open up the subject a little bit. I don't get to see you as often as I used to. Could you take five minutes and tell us uh, some of the other things that are going on at Metro right now and some of the major issues you're going to be dealing with in the coming year? I'd love to. <laughs> uh, Metro is an interesting agency. And, uh, of course, having worked in and out of government, uh, I'm finding it a, particularly, uh, a particular pleasure uh, because we, we are able to somewhat isolate uh, our agenda. We are not a general purpose government, as you know, but a service district. Uh, initially, of course, solid waste has to be top on our list. Uh, it, uh, it is a crisis. We are not at crisis, but we're certainly looking at one if we don't uh, solve this problem and resolve it appropriately. In addition to that, as you probably know, we, uh, we run the Washington Park Zoo. We are under, have a major construction project going on up there right now. We passed a ballot measure in March that funded our, uh, our construction efforts for the next three years and uh, the 50 percent operating subsidy. The rest of that budget is covered by, uh, by fees. You'll, I will take this opportunity to toot that horn a little bit. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that uh, our own Washington Park Zoo is the highest paid tourist attraction in this state. We had almost a million people there last year and we're run, our population figures are running that good again even though we're under construction. Uh, it is also uh, one of the top ten zoos in the nation. Uh, people in the zoo world look to Portland as one of the finest zoos in the country. So you can take some pride in that, I certainly do. Of course, uh, the big uh, new agenda is the Convention Center. Uh, it was passed uh, by the voters in November. Uh, we are uh, way down the road in terms of that work program. Uh, I was very pleased that we had an opportunity to uh, go get our first bond rating. Uh, a group of us went to New York in uh, last month. Uh, after the state had funded the $15 million uh, that we'd requested from them and the LID, Local Improvement District, had been formed by the city, uh, completing the financing package, uh, we made a, a, a good presentation in New York and we got a very, very favorable bond rating. Uh, what that really means uh, long term to you and to taxpayers in our community 
is that we were able to save approximately $5 million uh, in repayment of those bonds because we got such a good interest rate. So that was a very important effort, not only for the convention center and for the taxpayers, but it was also Metro's first bond rating. And uh, we have had some, uh, in this state, uh, some experience uh, since the whoops issue and since the veterans loan program, where uh, Oregon, Oregon uh, bonds were being rated quite low. So I think this was a very important uh, mark for, for the taxpayers, for uh, the community, for Metro, and for Oregon. Uh, we have a, a, an interim committee that uh, came out of this uh, state legislature that we at Metro supported. Uh, Senator Glenn Otto will be chairing a, an interim committee that will be looking at the agency, uh, not only its structure and its organization, uh, but other broader issues such as our relationship with TriMet, uh, whether or not we ought to take, take over services, what they ought to be. That's going to be operating in the next uh, 18 months to two years until the next session. And I imagine a number of you will be called upon to uh, testify and uh, to, uh, to come in and assist with that effort. Uh, I'm very supportive of that. It also, by the way, will be looking at the uh, City Club recommendation with regard to consolidation of the three counties. Uh, so I think that uh, the City Club will be playing a very uh, close role in looking at Metro and how it functions and whether or not we can make it better and what we ought to do long term with the agency. My position has been not to uh, aggressively seek out new programs, feeling that we needed to do well what we have on our plate before we start uh, looking for new jobs. Uh, we did, however, in this last legislative session, uh, in the waning days, the legislature gave us two new responsibilities. Uh, we will be, as a pilot program, uh, now responsible for appointing the Boundary Commissions. Uh, Boundary Commission, and we will also be uh, starting a pilot project to consolidate uh, business licensing, particularly contract licensing, in the region. So we have some new charges. I think we're doing very well, and I'm, uh, I'm delighted with where we are seven months later. There's another question. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, I'm Linda Peters. I'm a city club member uh, on the Standing Committee on Land Use and Transportation. And, and under a different hat, I'm also chairing the community coalition that is um, opposing the Bacona Road landfill site. Uh, as I've gotten involved in, <clears throat> in the garbage wars over the last couple of years, um, the, the thing that I think has been the most difficult for uh, for people who are new to the battle and bringing uh, new perspectives to the issue and seeing the opportunities that you've mentioned uh, for much more flexible and creative ways of dealing with garbage. One of, the, one of the things that's been most frustrating for us is the attitude of people who have been at it for many, many years and are convinced that most of the things they want to accomplish can't be accomplished. Uh, we've run against a terrific wall of frustration on the part of people in the legislature, people even on the Metro Council who've been through all of these siding uh, things and, and not come up winners with the ideas that they were trying to promote. I wonder if you can uh, speak for a moment to the issue of how we how we break through that frustration and get people to realize that it's a it's a different situation now that the alternatives that are proposed are viable and that we can look at garbage as a resource and not as a burden and that there are other things we can do that are better economically and better environmentally than park it all in a great big dump well, how, how do we break through all that well, you're right. It's very difficult. I think that we ha we're in a unique position here. Uh, God loves uh, Oregon. Because uh, in, it's rare, I think, uh, for a community to find themselves where all of these issues are coming together at a particular time after having had an eight-year or ten-year uh, experience that has, uh, that has really sensitized the public to the issue. And we are in the position where we have the landfill siding process, we have alternative technologies, we have recycling, we have all of those things coming together now toward the end of this year, which gives us, puts us in a position where we can't, we don't have to make decisions in terms of components 
uh, and we don't have systems in place that are going to be difficult now to turn around. So I think the biggest uh, trick to all of this is education, and we have an advantage in that I think our public has been sensitized over eight years to that. Now what we have to do is, uh, is educate well with regard to the fact that it is a resource, that technologically there are technical answers that are safe and sound. Uh, and I think that's part and parcel of Metro's job. We have to educate the public well. I have another written question. I referred to this uh, just briefly in my introduction. The leadership issues that Metro tackled during the first six months uh, has confused the general public and may have fueled discontent of Metro. Uh, what do you plan to do specifically to uh, improve Metro's tarnished image? <laughs> I have exactly the opposite uh, reading of that. I think that that may have done as much to improve Metro's credibility problem as, uh, as anything that we've done in the last seven months. Uh, I think, in fact, we were discussing it uh, before I started to speak. Uh, when I took office, uh, we had just done some polling uh, in the campaign, and one of the things that was clear, uh, and the numbers were there, was that 60% of the public didn't know what Metro was. They didn't know who they were, they didn't know what they did, and, and often confused it. They thought we ran buses, or, but basically, people did not know. I think that whole experience, one, heightened the awareness of what Metro was, and for people who, that were, who were really uh, unhappy with that agency, and 40% were very unhappy with that agency, I think it, uh, it uh, was a healthy experience and said to them, it's not going to be business at you, as usual at Metro anymore. That whole problem very quickly uh, was resolved by the council and myself in a responsible kind of way. Uh, we ended up uh, jointly supporting a separation of powers bill at the legislature that was passed. Uh, we've worked very well together, and I think that was a very positive experience. I don't see it as a negative at all. <clears throat> Thank you. John Charles, City Club member. Uh, I'd like you just to, to assume for a moment uh, a possible scenario that 18 months from now the Environmental Quality Commission under their discretionary authority might choose to mandate the Portlanders recycle authority vested in them in the 1983 legislature and that mandatory recycling would of course change the very nature of the, the waste flow and that if the, if the region is already committed in contracts to deliver <clears throat> X percent of the waste stream to, to a 24 hour a day burner or a composter and a, and a landfill, all three actually, in which there's debts to be paid off and, and uh, there's a need for garbage. <clears throat> have you thought through that scenario, and, and I'm sure you have, but what, what are your thoughts about the possibility, of course, of a mandatory recycling program uh, diverting sufficient flow that we have a, a legal problem delivering sufficient flows to, to these other facilities? That issue was debated uh, extensively at the legislature this year, and uh, in fact, uh, the legislature chose not to, uh, not to uh, require mandatory recycling. Uh, it is a complex problem, but in this particular instance, I don't think mandatory recycling at the home would, would change that substantially uh, the flow uh, the amount of flow that could go to alternative technologies. First of all, we have as a target in our waste management plan ap approximately 50 percent, uh, which we are going to try to attain in terms of recycling. We aren't anywhere near that close, and we are one of the highest, uh, uh, we have one of the highest percentages here of any place in the nation. Right now we're running about 22 percent, and that includes the bottle bill. Uh, but that, but the, the program that we're talking about in terms of alternative technologies, a burner and a composter, really would only address about 50% of this region's solid waste. There's still lots out there and it's growing by 50,000 tons every year. If in fact they did do a mandatory recycling uh, program, we have been, uh, we have been doing uh, our homework on that issue, uh, the, the household at source effort really would only impact what's going into the landfill by about 7%. The bulk of the recycling, when you're talking about in terms of mass and tonnage, is uh, paper products. And a lot of that is already being recycled. Nevertheless, it's an important 7%, and we need to work very hard to make that happen. 
Dan Goldie, City Club member. Uh, Rena, um, as a casual reader of the argument that's been going on over the question of where the new landfill should be, it seemed to me that the major focus was over the possibility of its polluting a community's water supply and what would they do with the waste. But as one who battles the worst transportation bottleneck in the state right now, which is on the Sunset Highway going back and forth, my understanding is that the bulk of those garbage trucks would go to the Bacona site over the Sunset Highway. Now, my question is, as the uh, agency, Metro's responsibility for planning transportation in the metropolitan area, have you been studying the impact on that tre tremendous transportation bottleneck on Sunset that would be uh, severely aggravated if, in effect, the land site was done at the Bacona Road site? Even as we speak, <laughs> we are studying that whole issue. Uh, you're right, uh, but well, you're right and, uh, and yet not right. Uh, it is not true that the bulk of the traffic would go over uh, the Sunset uh, Highway. Uh, a great deal of it would, far more than that, uh, than that facility, that, uh, that road needs. Uh, it's, uh, it is a major problem, uh, not only from uh, a solid waste standpoint in terms of uh, trying to handle the transportation problems that creates, but simply from where you started from, and that is that you have to battle it every day. Uh, that particular route is the, uh, is the number one priority in our transportation planning for light rail. Uh, the big issue is where's the money going to come from? Because we have, uh, while we, those are very expensive, high cost projects, as you know, uh, Max has been a roaring success, but we have gone through the bulk of the big money that was available uh, to this region. So that's going to be a major public policy question that is going to have to be addressed by Metro and by uh, this community over the next uh, couple of three years, is how are we going to handle our major capital needs in transit and, and, in, and in highway funding? And I think we'll be addressing that as well. But yes, we are looking at that in the study right now in terms of uh, Bacona Road. And that will also play into the decision that is made about whether or not you go with Bacona Road, Eastern Oregon, and what those options are. Dan, I think you've opened up a wonderful door of opportunity. Uh, Bill and I were just discussing here uh, the thought of, uh, of, of light rail to, uh, uh, to Washington County, and every other train could be a garbage train. <laughs> One way to pay for it. <laughs> what do you project will happen uh, with the cost of garbage service as Metro puts the new systems and facilities into place? There, there simply is no question about the fact that it is going. The costs are going to go up, and they're going to go up substantially. Uh, part of our effort, however, and part of our decision making, has to, of course, take that into consideration. How much uh, can uh, the general public afford? And, uh, and we are going to be looking at all of that. We don't have, what we have right now are very soft figures. Uh, and that's why uh, that decision will be coming down along about uh, September, October. Uh, and we really won't have hard figures in terms of how much it's going to go up until we really do get into, into decisions like uh, Bacona Road, we're doing cost work on that now, when we're really negotiating hard with Eastern Oregon, when we are, have been through the preliminary uh, negotiating process and have selected a particular vendor in alternative technology in a burner to negotiate with. Uh, they're expensive projects, but on the whole, uh, our, our research shows uh, and our work shows that uh, there, isn't any, there isn't anything you're going to do that isn't going to cost you more money we can somewhat mitigate that in terms of those choices. And that's what we'll be doing. Uh, another written question with environmental uh, kind of implications. How do we get manufacturers of our consumer products to reduce the amount of wasteful packaging they foist on us? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> I, 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 we looked at this uh, when the session, the legislative session was on. And basically it has to be federal legislation. 
we don't have in this state enough producers to impact anything substantially. The bulk of the industrial machine that does that is not in Oregon. Uh, and the, the final uh, opinion we came to is it really does have to be a national effort. Uh, so I think we all ought to start writing our congressmen. Currently, Oregon, uh, this is news to me, does not require households or businesses to have garbage service. Uh, do you foresee in the future that Metro will look at uh, supporting mandatory garbage service in order to, one, facilitate source separation of recyclables, two, ensure that Metro has control over all of the region's garbage, and three, uh, to ensure that people do not dump their garbage uh, in the uh, roadsides and stream beds uh, as the cost of garbage service inevitably increases. In other words, Alice's Restaurant. I would imagine that the legislature is probably going to look at that. I don't think it's so much a matter of uh, flow control or, uh, or it, the impact there as it is in terms of the uh, illegal dumping. And I think whoever asked the question, I think you're accurate, uh, that uh, as costs increase, you probably get more of that. Uh, and uh, as that becomes a real public policy problem, I would imagine that the legislature will look at authorizing that. It isn't really uh, within Metro's authority to authorize that. What is the environmental impact of the proposed incinerator? And that's a, that's a, a, a hard question uh, to answer simply because I could talk for about two days on environmental impacts. Uh, on the whole, as you, uh, as you probably know, we have a, a wonderful prototype down, right down the road, the Marion County Burner, which is state of the art uh, in terms of when it was built. In fact, uh, the technology has moved so fast past that now uh, that uh, uh, the one that we would be, uh, we would be building uh, would be s uh, way beyond it. But that facility is considered state-of-the-art and is touted all over the country as uh, the, the best facility uh, available. Uh, I have been through that facility. I would urge you to do it. It's remarkable. Uh, and uh, what they have, they have that stack monitored by three different agencies, EPA, DEQ, and I think they've got a contract with the University of Oregon. It's monitored by computer, and the emissions are so low that they don't even register by the, on the computer most of the, most of the time. They're minimal. They're way below EPA and DEQ standards. And that's, that goes back to one of the issues that, that uh, someone else raised here, and it has to do with education. The technological ability to deal with those things is here. But what we have, unfortunately, is a great deal of fear about that. And we have to educate well. And we have to be sure that we pick the right kinds of technologies and insist that such things as scrubbers and those kinds of things that make that environmentally sound are well within that project. Yes. Uh, Jim Sitzman, member of the City Club uh, and also member of the Standing Committee on Land Use and Transportation. Uh, one of the subjects of our committee's uh, research in the past uh, it, that was also shared in by another of the club's committee had to do with uh, the whole question of siting unwanted facilities in the community. And uh, an issue that was raised in, in our re research was that s there ought to be, in many of these cases, an opportunity to provide to the communities that receive these facilities some kind of uh, payback in the form of uh, community improvements uh, or uh, offsetting some of the negative impacts. Are these kinds of considerations part of Metro's thinking with regard to a landfill or uh, a uh, resource recovery uh, site? Uh, and if so, what kinds of options are you looking at? Yes, uh, well, it, they've certainly been part of my thinking, uh, and, and the legislature as well in this session uh, provided uh, that for a landfill, particularly a, a regional landfill, that there will be a, a, a surcharge on tonnage that will go back to the community. Uh, I did include in, in my executive budget uh, this year uh, a, a mitigation fee for the Clackamas Transfer Center 
Uh, the council, however, uh, decided that that was not uh, something they wanted to fund and removed it. My own feeling about that is that that is that mitigation of that sort will make it ever so much easier to deal with those kinds of siding problems, and particularly as, uh, as such things uh, happen as are happening in St. Helens and in Eastern Oregon, where communities are becoming aware that, that uh, garbage is a resource to the community and can have a great payoff in terms of uh, economic development. So yeah, I think, I think that needs to be done. I have not been able to convince my council of it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised what they will uh, revisit that whole issue. Yes, Jerry. Charles Davis, club member. Uh, I think I don't want to ask a question. I want to raise a, a we raise a question and and uh, and uh, phrase a caution. <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, we often talk about recycling and we talk about uh, waste to energy as a kind of free lunch way of getting rid of garbage. The fact is that the Salem plant to which you referred is mandatory recycling. That simply is a facility that produces energy we do not need that's surplus and costs the customers of Portland General Electric more money to pay their electric bills than they would have without it. I think it's important to keep that in mind. That may be the appropriate way to do it, but uh, it is misleading to bury the cost of recycling in our electric rates, particularly at a time when we have uh, a great surplus of energy in the Northwest. I think we have one final written question. I think the others that we have have been pretty well covered, but uh, this one says, would taking our garbage to Eastern Oregon be the right message for the public, given recycling, waste reduction, et cetera? I'm not sure I understand the question with regard to the right message to the public. I've had the question asked before about uh, whether or not we're so it's socially responsible for us to ship our garbage somewhere else. My own view of that is, uh, of course it is. If uh, a community in, uh, um, in Eastern Oregon seizes it as an economic development plus and want the business and have a safer, more environmentally sound facility than we can site here, and it's economically feasible, then it seems to me that that is an appropriate option for all concerned. I happen to be one of those people who likes to see everybody be winners, and I think that's one of the things that uh, is a possibility here. Now, if in fact we were just turning around and dumping our problem on someone else who, was, who did not want that problem, then I think that that would not be appropriate. Thanks very much, Raina. We really appreciate these comments on a, on a real, real serious problem. Do we have one more question? If I may. Yes. I've been dividing 100 million tons by what I consider to be a, a railway capacity. It came out to about 25 cars, uh, trains a day to carry it all. It raises my mind how big a portion of the cost of garbage disposal is transportation and how much is the related handling and land cost. Do you have any <clears throat> offhand guesses in that regard? Uh, let me start by saying it's a million tons a year, not a hundred million tons. Uh, and, and you're right, transportation uh, does play a major role. Uh, we are currently in the process of assessing that and it depends a great deal on what kind of transportation mode you're using. Uh, one of the companies that's, uh, that is looking at an Eastern Oregon landfill is considering barge. Uh, one of them is considering rail. And, uh, and the uh, St. Helens facility would like to see barge. Uh, barging on the whole, has, our numbers show that it's more expensive than either rail or trucking. In fact, trucking ends up being the cheapest. That is, of course, if you don't figure into that equation, wear and tear on your highways and those kinds of issues. But we don't have any real hard numbers yet. Uh, the question in terms of how much it costs the system depends upon which, which mode of transportation you use, how much is dedicated, how much is going, uh, that kind of thing. Generally speaking, the more tonnage you're shipping, the cheaper the price gets.
thanks again, Rena. I uh, do urge you uh, once again to uh, uh, come next week. Uh, the subject is economic development, and perhaps Oregon's greatest growth industry will receive further discussion next week. Thanks again, Rena. <laughs>